Osiris. Spotlight On is brought to you by Light, the technology platform reimagining e commerce for live events. You can learn more about Light at light.com forward slash partnerships. That is L Y T E dot com forward slash partnerships. Hello and welcome to Spotlight On, presented by Osiris Media. I'm your host, Lawrence Purrier. Today the spotlight shines on Marcus Reuter, a Berlin-based music producer, composer, performer, and creative educator with international credentials and a vast discography. Marcus tours the world regularly, both as a solo artist with various bands and as a teacher. Over the last 25 years, Marcus has created work touching on the musical worlds of ambient, contemporary classical, progressive and art rock, industrial, world jazz, and much, much more. He studied with Robert Fripp and has worked in and around the world of King Crimson, including his role as a member of the Stickmen with Tony Levin and Paul Mastellato. Marcus joined us to talk about his latest project, Mata Atlantica, which will be available worldwide this Friday, November 18th. Using contributions by many brilliant musicians, plus vivid tropical field recordings, Marcus has created a sonic collage that attempts to recreate the acoustic texture of this endangered Brazilian biotope. We covered much ground before and after discussing this project, and I hope you enjoy our talk. Hello. Hey, Lawrence. Marcus, how are you? Very nice to meet you. I'm fine. <laughs> I don't know why we're laughing at each other, but I feel I feel the impulse to laugh as well. <laughs> we, you know, we're, we're friendly people, right? <laughs> and we're we're, we're bit, bitted men. That's what I was thinking. It was it was the handsome beards that we have going on here for the benefit of our listeners. How are you today? Things are good. I'm in Berlin, Germany, and sort of like I have to admit, winter is starting somehow. Like it looks like winter, even though it's still fall. Yeah, but not my favorite time of year. <laughs> mm. Yeah, I'm just outside of Seattle, and it's very similar. It went from being unseasonably warm to unseasonably cold in the period of about 12 hours. Yeah, exactly, exactly. No, but I, I, I love it here, and it's like the center of my life is here. I've chosen to go back to Germany. I am German, but I, I'm still traveling a lot, but I was away for a long time. And I came back in 2014 to Germany, mm. and I chose Berlin because... Berlin is not Germany. It's like, it's its own ecosystem somehow and a big melting pot. And like, I don't know, like comparable with something like New York, like Seattle, San Francisco, maybe Austin, you know, something like that. And it's, it's wonderful here. Where in Germany did you grow up? I grew up in the West. It's a place called Ruhrgebiet. It's the, like the biggest yeah, metropolitan area in Germany. Mm -hmm. It's quite, uh, Quite industrial, even though I, I was born in a pretty small city. So, and grew up there. It's, it's called Lipstadt, if you want to look it up, but <laughs> it's, it's really small. The funny thing is like something that may be uh, like, yeah, relevant for our conversation. I've never really felt home at home. I never developed a sense of home until I left home. The place where I studied psychology, that was Bielefeld, Germany. That's where, where I first developed feelings of like, okay, this is home. But like my real home, my parents' house never felt like home. What constitutes feeling of home for you? What, what did resonate for you? It's like something that sort of, I think, got defined for me later on in life. So like looking back, I really don't know. I, I guess I felt sort of like felt out of place or I felt like my, my vision or the way that I was didn't really fit, but I never focused on that. I didn't, didn't, didn't feel like an outsider, mm. even though I guess I was, but I never felt like that. Then once I started traveling, going to some other place to live, then I was, was starting to see like the power of actually moving around and gathering information about the world in the end, like as a whole, like traveling the whole planet now, almost the whole planet. By actually starting to travel, starting to move, around in Germany, then to Austria, and the US, and et cetera, I really learned what something like home could actually mean. And I just didn't have that before. If not Germany, where would you settle? Yeah, I guess the US. 
Yeah. I think in 93 was my first time in the US. So 30 years, almost 30 years ago. And in uh, 2005, I started coming regularly, two, three, four times a year. And I joined an American band, Stickman, with Tony Levin and Pat Masolotto in 2011. And so that's 11 years of, of being in an American business relationship, even like right, with, with two Americans. I have to say, I love the American people as a whole, I would say, and especially the people that I meet on the road. I also think that for music, Americans are an, an amazing audience. It's really an interesting thing. I don't, I don't I think a lot of people talk about that, but playing in the U.S. is one of the, mo it's one of the most enjoyable things for me. I have some assumptions about what you mean, but I would love it if you could unpack that just a little bit. What, what is the, what is the contrast or what is it about the American audience? There's sort of like a, a dedication and love that is kind of unique in a way. There is a sort of like excitement mm. that is very different from the excitement of, of people in South America, for example. Like in, in, in Argentina, people are like more excited, like on the, on the surface, let's say. But with the American people, I can see there's like real commitment. I know a lot of people have come to every single opportunity they had to see me. They, they came. Right. There's like really this, this long term love that, that I feel. I guess it's also because I'm playing with musicians who've been playing live for a long time. Like Tony Levin, who started playing publicly maybe, I don't know, 65 years ago or something. A long time. And, and so there, there's really like the sense of continuity and, and of tradition and of belonging, which is a really, really strong, beautiful, wonderful thing that my friends and fans in America, they, North America, they know how to transmit that, that feeling to, to me as the artist. It's very interesting that you bring that up because as, as you were speaking, I was thinking about some of my experiences and just perceptions of how I engage with artists and music. I grew up on the East coast of America in Connecticut, and then I spent about 20 years in New York City, mid-90s to the mid-teens. And that was a very fertile time for what I would broadly call music similar to what you do. You know, I think of like the downtown scene, John Zorn, Bill Laswell, all those artists were, and to an extent are, very accessible, performing a lot, performing in very unique, interesting spaces. In retrospect, I realized how spoiled I was, but at the time it was just, oh, we could go see Zorn for three nights at the Knitting Factory or a Tonic or what, you know, it was just, he was there. Now I'm on the West Coast outside of Seattle and I realize we're not starved by any means for music, but in preparation for our discussion, I was looking at your tour dates and I saw the Stickman and I, I thought, oh, well, there's like three or four places I could go see them if I, and so I, I wonder if there's that element of like, this music does not come around that often so i better make the most of it <laughs> yeah. yeah yeah for sure and, and comparing east and west coast of the u.s like we do play the east coast like sometimes twice a year and like the, the west coast maybe every three four years like one of the interesting aspects about the u.s is that there has been this or still is the tradition of the college radio yeah which is something that here in germany i it didn't doesn't exist and it didn't it certainly didn't exist like 30 years ago or something. And I think that that you can tell which area had people that were interested, say, in progressive rock, for example. You know, in Canada, it's it's Quebec and Quebec City, where there are like lots and lots of rock fans. And like I was always wondering, yeah, why is that? And so it's I think there's several reasons. And in the US, I'm sure it has to do with the DJs that did the the college radio. Right. And so that, that influence. So you can really see where you have nests. Uh, you have a nest of frog people. You have a nest of fun people, blah, blah, blah. All of this all around the US. And yes, it's true that the East Coast seems to be more populated with fans of the music kind of music that I do. Yeah. You're absolutely right. I think you're definitely onto something with the, with the college radio thing. And I, and I think about again, in my own experience, finding that one station that might have the two or three hour program once a week where you might hear Sonny Chirac or an old live King Crimson album or, or just music that if you didn't have somebody to initiate you, 
you probably were not going to find. And radio definitely plays that role and has played that role for a long time in America. I do promise that I want to talk to you about your projects, but I, I something that that stuck out for me and that you mentioned it briefly was that you studied psychology. I think it would be very hard to have a meaningful conversation with you to and, and not ask how and what is the overlap in the study of psychology, your interest in music, but then also, I think, you know, like Gurdjieff, is there an overlap of the psychology, the music, the mysticism, the personal spiritual work? Like, what is that? What, 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 what cauldron is all of that in? It's good that you're asking that question because then I have to think about it. I don't think about that so much, but like one idea that just came to mind is that psychology or being a psychologist or working as a clinical psychologist can be like being a musician, but you don't need any musical instrument other than yourself as in your voice. So it's almost like being a singer, hmm. right? It's like you, you are a listener and a singer. That's like, that's what a clinical psychologist could be. And if you are a great psychologist, like meaning like you're musically dealing with people, I think you can be very successful in healing people. I think that's, that's sort of like one thought that just, just came as you were formulating the question. The overlap for me always has been, it's my person, right? Like I studied psychology because I didn't know what I wanted to do. I had like the, my grades in, in high school were all, all very good. I don't know how, what the system is that in, in the U.S., like A's or whatever, right? Like, like I had all A, just A's, right? So I didn't know, like I couldn't see. I'm more interested in politics than mathematics. No, oh, two A's, right? So like I, I just didn't know. So I took a book which had like the list of all the, all the courses that we have at German universities. And I went through the book and everything I was reading, like, ah, okay, I, I kind of have an idea what that is. Well, and psychology was the only thing where the, maybe the description was so bad in that, <laughs> that I, that, that I, I just couldn't tell what that was about. And so that's why I chose it because that's sort of like one of my intuitive principles to kind of like choose the things that inspire me that I don't know anything about. I have like that researcher hat on naturally. Like I was born with that, I guess, somehow. Yeah. yeah. And, and so, and so what was interesting though is that I realized as I was studying psychology, which is more like the experimental psychology at the University of, of Bielefeld in Germany, yeah. I realized that I actually do have a talent for clinical psychology and adverbs almost, right? People were coming to me for advice. So I was always kind of like in that position. Again, in inverted commas of a teacher, just the way I am. The relationship that then grew for myself was that my, my teachers, my uh, music teachers back when I was like 18 and 19 years old, both in high school and Robert Fripp, who I, I met at that age, they both said to me, Marcus, you shouldn't really try to professionalize your musical education. Let's say, so don't go to a conservatory or anything. They, they kind of recommended to learn something proper. And like the argument was like Robert Fripp said, like, if you're a professional musician, you're going to do it anyway. Mm -hmm. And, but you will have to learn something else that you can use to make some money. And my other teacher, Karl-Heinz Strittmanns, he had, he did say something really moving to me. Like when it was the day when he was quitting teaching the high school and we had like a, a goodbye party, he said to me, Marcus, Marcus, you, you please go out there and you, I want you to be the composer that I never became because I chose a path in education. And that's, that still gives me goosebumps. But so what happened then was I studied psychology almost, you could say like on the side. It was something like I was like obsessed with music, practicing my instrument, studying music in general. I started studying at the, at university in 93. September 93, and I had started practicing musical instruments in early 93. So it's almost, almost started at the same time. These two paths, they kind of like helped each other. I was very emotionally sane because I was actually doing something that I loved, which was the music and then studying and like reading and all that stuff that we had to do. That was like the old fashioned psychology studies still 
you know, nowadays here in Germany, we also have like the bachelor and master system that you guys have. But back then it was like the old, still the old thing that had grown over a hundred years or more. It was really, really hard. But because I had music, it was easy for me. It was easy and it was, it was just a wonderful time. Both of these things have grown together. If we were you know, like talking about this specific musical projects, because there's always a psychology aspect in the music as well. It's not just that I see work of a good psychologist as musical. You can also uh, employ psychological concepts in musical composition, for example. It's interesting to hear you articulate that. You know, you mentioned Fripp, which I, I didn't think we would get too far into the conversation without him coming up. But I think of this, it's like a parallel lineage almost of people like him, Keith Jarrett, John Zorn, like these people that are they're master musicians, and I think of them also as like these mystic philosophers. It's very hard to untangle them. And I couldn't even tell you that there's an overriding message. Maybe you can because you're closer to some of them as individuals mm -hmm. and just creatively. But is there like what, what, what am I on to when I, when I, when I struggle to articulate this? <laughs> you know, I, I, I think, I think I know what you're talking about. I think what it is, is that a real artist, okay, I'm using this word without defining it like real. There's something about it where you are actually, you're becoming who you are via a practice. Just like people say that you are what you eat, which in a way is true, right? But you are also what you practice, like things you're thinking about, or if you actually pick up a musical instrument or a pen and paper and you start composing and you do that for 30 years, you sort of like become a spiritual, you're becoming something that's more unique than you are already unique. I don't know how to put it. Like everyone is unique, right? But then when you start practicing something, you're kind of like filtering everything you do throughout your own understanding. It's like an iterative process, right? So you become an expert for what you do. And that also leads to one becoming less connected with the outside world, which can sometimes be a problem, but it's got a sort of like a side effect of becoming like the best, let's say, or like the most dedicated in a particular field. And with Fripp, there's, there's like the, the way that he studied the guitar, which was already pointing to the direction of what he then experienced with Gurdjieff, with Gurdjieff's uh, school, Bennett. He, I think he started with Bennett. I think that the personal practice is what leads to, from the outside, these people kind of like appear like being on it. I don't want to say like a pedestal, but that's, that's not, not, not the right image, but they stick out because they actually spend their life working on something very particular. That resonates. The, the metaphor that, that strikes me here and you say that is it's a, it's like a, like a polished stone almost. You could see the pile of stones, but one sticks out because it's, it's just shiny and reflective and it's been honed. Yeah. Yes. Yes. And then also, like I said, the more of a specialist you become, also the less you know about other things. So there's always, there's always also like a, a negative side. And like what I see about myself, what I see in Robert Fripp, and like John Zorn, I'm not sure because I don't know him, right, personally. But there's always like a little bit of something that, that you're not good at. And it's kind of like, and this is, this is sort of like interesting because like the image that people have, because they see this, the shiny stone is that they believe that you're perfect on the whole. But you're not perfect on the whole and you're not shiny on the whole. It's just that layer that has been polished because it comes to the surface, right? And so that's the, that's what people see. That's what people respond to. And then they start attributing like everything to, to you, even though you may not even be the originator ideas or compositions or stuff like that. This happens a lot in the arts world where. Sometimes the people who really do the work, they don't get any recognition because of this effect. As you were saying that, what I was thinking was the, the, you add the celebrity repercussion to that and you think about the pressure. I mean, maybe at one extreme, the example could be like a Dylan where he becomes a vessel for everybody's projection. But there's other musicians over the years. I think of 
Jerry Garcia. I'm sure there's others throughout the Pantheon, some who suffered greatly because of that, the pressure of being the thing that other people project. Yes. And it's almost like a best before date on some people, <laughs> right? Which is, which is kind of like sad to me. Yeah. Like, because what it means is that those people haven't found a way to stay emotionally healthy so that they can continue their path of practice up until they're old. And that's what, what's great about Robert Sherp again, as you want to talk about him. He, he, you know, he still does his thing. That's it's great. It's wonderful. But like one of my favorite musicians, Mike Oldfield, for example, who's really like, I think like the, 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 the biggest gift that music has gotten in a long time, this guy, he got burned out. Who knows why? And I don't know. Like, I think that a big role that the, the music, the music business, the old music business did play a big role in, in really killing the emo, the creative, say like the creative creativity or creative impulse in, really talented artists very early on. And this fact that we still see youngish artists die of drugs, it's horrible. Horrible. I think a, a big part of that is related to that old idea of, of success, like what success really means, and that everything is governed by number, which has, which has gotten worse with uh, the internet and social media. And, and at the same time, because everything has blown up so much, Numbers don't, don't, don't mean anything anymore, but somehow intuitively we do believe that it's important to sell a lot of records or to have a lot of money or whatever, or followers or something like that. But it's really not relevant anymore in this world because everything is based, has always been based around qualities, right? But nowadays qualities actually count again because numbers are totally dead. Yeah. Have you seen with the rise of the internet, and I'll say that in air quotes because it's such a broad term, but you know, the, the communications and the discovery enabled by the internet. Have you seen that impact your ability to find audience and audience to find you? Yeah. You know, I, I got super lucky because when I got, had my first email account, that was at university in 93 or early 94. It really enabled me to actually find an audience. I remember there was a time when I was researching. Polish radios and radio DJs in the US were playing ambient music. I was making, you know, purely making ambient music back then. And when I had my first release in early 98, I had a list. I was, I sent out CDs and like my music got played. And so it was really a very good start. Also back then, the medium like email was still very, very, very important. So there were these email lists. I'm sure you remember. Of course, yeah. You know, yes. <laughs> a lot of friendships were made back then. And if this is, again, this is so funny. When I'm on the road, almost every show, there's somebody who I've known for like 25 years or longer or more because like we've been on the same mailing list in 95. Or something. It's, it's really interesting. It's really interesting. It's beautiful. Yeah. For me, for me, it enabled a lot. And then obviously once the MP3 came around, Napster came around and like the whole business was kind of floating for such a long time. I think it's unavoidable that it is the way it is now. You can't really make a law that makes people not embrace technology. I don't know. I'm, I'm kind of okay with it, but I, like for maybe the first time in like five or six years, I went into like a big, like electronics store today where they sell washing machines and computers and blah, blah, blah. And also they always used to have like a big, CD department there, right? And the saddest moment for me in my musician's life to kind of like go into a place like that and remember the way it used to be and the way it is now. It's really just, just such a relic, such a anachronistic kind of idea, right? And, and it, it really, I have to say, it still hurts. It still hurts me because I am there. I, and I'm not there anymore. And I never really was a big presence in a store like that, right? I started building my own audience or my own network, let's say, early on. And without the internet, that would have never happened. Also, like uh, Facebook as like the, the first the biggest social network was very important. It still is kind of like one of the main outlets for all the stuff that I do, for the information, for the news that I'm transmitting, you know? Yeah, yeah. It's fascinating what you say about going into one of those stores because 
probably a similar cadence as you. Like I, I have no reason to go into one. And then every few years I'll stumble into a, a shop like that. You know, those big electronic you know, home stuff stores. They're both familiar and foreign. I, I wonder who, who comes here and is there enough? Like I, it, it's hard to, to even understand that there's enough scale to keep the place running. Exactly. So strange. It's like another time that somehow it's like they forgot to close down. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. <laughs> it's just running on autopilot. <laughs> yeah. You really described the, what I experienced today there. And then I feel like, am I part of this? Like, do I have this sort of patina, right? Of being like old and new at the same time or attractive or not and unattractive at the same time or already forgotten. I only, I'm only 50, right? 50 sounds a lot like <laughs> to the young people, but it's not, it's not that old, right? 50 was old when we were young. When I, when my parents turned 50, they seemed so old. And my teenager says to me, I can't believe you're 50. You don't seem old. And I, I, you know, I'm very happy to hear that because I think it has to do with life, embrace of life. But yeah, 50 used to be close to the end. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. 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 I remember when John Zorn turned 50. I remember the week of shows at, at Tonic or the month of shows. That was, uh, I, I actually, I remember him turning 40, going to those shows at the Knitting Factory, 50 at Tonic and 60. I remember sitting at a concert hall in New York for, it was, that was only one night, but it was amazing. It was a, it was like a review of all the different ensembles, Masada, Barcoba, whoever, you know, it was, it was just incredible. In, 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 incredible. And it's so amazing that he still keeps going and, and his catalog, <laughs> like it's, it's almost comic, but in a good way, very good way. No, it is. It's like life is performance art. It's unbelievable. Yes. Yes. <laughs> We'll be back with more Spotlight On, presented by Osiris Media, after this break. And now, back to Spotlight On. Obviously, the impetus to speak with you was because of, um, and please f f pardon the ignorant American if I get the pronunciation wrong, for uh, Mata Atlantica? Yes. There's so much that's interesting about this project. I wondered if maybe we could start, if it's not too annoying as an artist, to sort of look under the hood and talk about how the compositions came together. Were these field recordings over which other artists added parts? Like, could you talk a little bit about the, the sort of genesis of the actual music itself? No, it's, it's not annoying at all. I'm happy to talk about it because it's sort of like a magical process. It was a magical process. You know, music making kind of like lives on various levels, right? So you can make a, you can make a sound yourself or you can ask somebody else to make a sound. You can be the person recording the sound. You can be the person processing the sound later on, mixing it, mastering, blah, blah, arranging it, orchestrating it. Like also all these old terms that we used to use when there was no recording technology, right? All of that is part of music making. So with Mata Atlantica, I kind of like took the, and I, I have to give you a little bit of background here, because like the person who gave the money, let's say, and who had the idea, who calls himself Matthias Dera on the cover, but that's not his real name. No, but he doesn't want people to know who he is. He came to me, he was saying, Marcus, I have this idea to make a Brazil project, he called it, Brazil project. And then he he said it's like he visited the rainforest and I've, I've never been there. So this is, this is also interesting. Like I wasn't there. So he told me about it. He told me about his ideas that he wanted to have some sort of product that he could give this association that is like planted new trees there and stuff like that. He wanted to give them material so that they could promote what they do. That was the original idea. So it was like more of the. The, the idea of doing something that has some sort of function in a commercial context, mm -hmm. somewhat commercial context. It turned out that because when, when we started, he just gave me a bunch of Brazilian rhythms where he said, okay, let's start with those. We did then what I did then. I have a, a very good friend of mine, Tobias Reba in Switzerland, who's one of the most amazing music programmers, you could say, right? He, he does this amazing stuff where he extracts data from our, 
audio files. He can reconstruct sounds or rhythms or stuff from that. He's a wizard. He's a wizard. <laughs> he's, a, he's a wizard. And he did this, this wonderful thing where he took those rhythms and he, he kind of like transformed them into something completely different. But at the same time, it was still something that sounded like Brazilian rhythms, but they were really not. They were like in odd time signatures and stuff. So, but anyway, so he did something like that, like, like more like, like some cuss of sounds and also like these really artificially generated bell sounds, almost like singing bowls and stuff. And that was the foundation for this project where like he sent us or sent me his files. And then I kind of like started chopping them, taking stuff out like maybe adding a little bit here and there. And I started writing a little bit of a chord sequence there just because I wanted to have some more material that other musicians could respond to. So I came in at the second stage kind of adding some chords, right? I can't remember if I even played them on the keyboard or if I just typed them in, them in something like that. You know, I'm in a wonderful position as a very widely respected musician that I can basically ask any musician on this planet and any great musician if they want to contribute something to a project of mine. So the first two people I invited were Gary Huspin, who is famous for his drumming, but he's like an amazing pianist, and keyboard player. So I asked him to contribute keyboards. Raphael Proschel, who is an Austrian bass player who I met on a pro cruise, actually. <laughs> and uh, <laughs> he's just out of this world great. Like, I have to say this, like, and I'm not just talking technically, I'm talking like about like the whole like living music, you know, being music. And so I, I was thinking, okay, so we'll just send these, these files, to those two guys, and they played their parts, believe it or not, as you hear them on the record, still like the editing, like the editing, I would, I tried to, like my, my idea, my concept was not to take away to try to make things work. So I wasn't judgmental in which parts to keep. I was kind of like coming it from the perspective of I want to keep everything and I, but I want to kind of like maybe add something that makes things work that don't work. So like, so that was my function in the whole process was rather than being an editor in the sense of taking stuff away, I kept adding shades, color of all kinds of like little parts that then sort of like connected everything and turned in and created this whole. And Matthias, actually, Matthias Dela, he actually wrote some of the vocal melodies that you hear on the record that we then had at like almost at the end of the process, we had those sung by professional singers. The project really still is almost, almost too much for us even like because it's so great. It sounds as if it was played life in the studio. Yeah. And there's, there's so much life in it. I don't see this as a COVID project at all, but in fact it is. It was recorded last year, 2021. It's really such a wonderful, yeah. I mean, people need to hear it in order to kind of like understand what this is. And it works in so many levels. You can, you can, it can really work inside sort of like a bar context can be playing in the background. You don't really need to actively listen to kind of like get drawn in, but you can also sit there with headphones on and really dive in and uh, hear all those, those wonderful intricate parts. Because like I said, because there was no editing, like also all the wrong notes are in there. Yeah. Like the, the, the things where the musicians maybe were thinking, oh, Marcus is going to take that out. Right. No, I left all of those in. <laughs> and I think it's, <laughs> <laughs> well, it's funny because one of the, in my notes here, one of the first things that I wrote in all capital letters was recorded so beautifully that it just breathes. It breathes. The, whoever mixed it, if that was you or whomever it was, the mixing is just so delicate, so beautiful. The mi mixing is incredible. This is a new friend that I first met only last year, Stefano Castagna from Italy. He lives very close to the Lake Garda, which is a beautiful, beautiful part of Italy. He has this wonderful studio and he's in his sixties, I think. So he's very experienced. He was most famous for doing like dance remixes for Japanese labels or something. They did that in the nineties. That's how he made his money. But he's like one of the most amazing musicians I've ever met also. And I say musicians. He's an engineer. You could say he's a technician. No, he's not. He's a musician. He plays the recordings that I gave him. He mixes them in such a way that it adds another level of, of musicality. That's kind of like what I was 
trying to say when we started talking about this, that you can make music on many, many levels. And I would go so far that to say that the person listening to the music is a musician because without that person listening to the music, the music will never become alive. It's like that the, the recipient is part of that whole thing as much as the person creating. The recipient also creates. There's filtering. There's like, we can never know what, say, a Naked City sounds like to uh, your wife or to your brother or like, we, we don't know. And that's the beauty of it. And I, I try to embrace that. So my, like I said, my philosophy not to be judgmental about the contributions is exactly that idea that I don't know how people are going to hear it. So how can I say that something is good or bad? That the thing that, a thing that I might take away, somebody else will love. So that's why I say, okay, no, I'm just going to find a way to make the contributions work the way they are. One thing that strikes me is the, uh, the idea of like the, the entire process from recording, composition, layering, engineering, mixing, mastering to the consumption of it. But then also where those things all meet in the playback system, even because I'm going to have a different experience if I'm listening in this versus listening in the earbuds or in the open my desk monitors or downstairs on the good system. And all of those things impact how the listener receives. That's why I'm not a big fan of doing everything myself, even though I could, you know, like Mata Atlantica, I, I did want to mix it myself. What I had in my session files, what was like where I was composing and arranging, yeah. that already sounded great. And then I said to Matthias at the end, I said, no, let's get somebody else's perspective on it. And it will make it better. It will make it bigger. And that has always been my, my philosophy that the more perspectives you're actually getting while you're creating, the more people can potentially enjoy it because it's not just one person's perspective. I mean, like in the, in the history of music, there are examples of, of the opposite, like where Prince would do everything himself or. CV Wonder or Mike Oldfield or, you know, like where there's really like this, that singular vision and it works. But I think in general, it's a rare, it's a rare thing. Like, and yeah. I enjoy collaboration. I love getting feedback. That's like one thing that I'm like still missing in this world generally is that it, people have a hard time being honest with each other. And like, if, if somebody's honest, like people are kind of pissed off or something, right? No, I think it helps. Like if I'm, if I'm making a mistake playing my instrument and somebody sees from the outside because I can't see it, like I'm lifting up my shoulder or something, right? I want that other person to say that so that I have a chance to look at that myself and to see like, how can I relax that? Or maybe I can say, Oh no, it's exactly the way it needs to be. But without the feedback, there is no growth. I'm sort of, sort of missing that in general society a little bit, I have to say. But for the group of people I'm working with, Either it's okay to be completely critical or, as I said before, it's also okay not to be judgmental at all. Yeah. Can a music like this be presented in a live format? Do you have aspirations for that? Or is this just a project that is born and lives and then you move on? It would totally be possible to perform this live. Yeah, of course. Yeah. You'd have a relatively big band to do it. But yeah, it's possible. And I would have the aspiration to do it if I knew that it would actually be worthwhile. But it would be difficult for people to convince me that it would be. <laughs> for what I would call sort of serious music, non, non-pop non idiom music, composer-driven music or improvised music, is there a patronage system in Germany? Like, how, how do you get a project off the ground? Do you have to go find the people like Matthias or how does it work? Yeah, I mean, exactly. Like Matthias is sort of like a patron of the arts, right? And I'm lucky that I've met him. The fact that he does give me a job like that, where he simply creates a project that doesn't have to be, right? It's not something that is necessary. Yeah. But yeah, no, there's no such system as in, at least not for, not in my world. You know, the thing is like, I come from a, from a total working class background, I got sort of got lucky because my parents put me in a better high school 
thinking that it would be good for me, but they had no idea. I, I think they did well, right? But for example, I was in my high school. I was in what I call the scum class. You know, I was in the in the class with all the people, with all the kids that had working class parents. Yeah. The other groups, they were doctors, kids, or, you know, lawyers, kids, and stuff like that. And they got much better education than we did. My parents didn't know, but they, they kind of like always tried to kind of give me something that was better than they had. But then you look, I remember when I was like maybe 17 or something like that. And I saw that like these, again, like these doctors, kids, the rich people, kids, they were actually performing theater plays in French. Like once I started, I had some contact with them. I realized, how, oh, come on, how is that possible? Like, like from my perspective, like from my background, like it was not, not something would ever occur to me, right? That I could do something like that. This idea of the fine arts or like you know, something. I think that like any sort of like patronage system or something like it, it works if you're kind of already there sort of like from birth. Yeah. And for me, it has, and still is extremely difficult to kind of like live within that central, what I call like the, the middle or the central layer of the, of the arts sandwich, which is kind <laughs> of like, like this is, this is like a, like a, like an image I came up with like maybe 20 years ago is that there's like a bottom layer, which is like all the hobbyists, people who are making music just for the love of it or music or painting or whatever, any sort of art artistic endeavor. And then there's like this thick middle layer, which is where there is actually funding where people, in order to make a project, they need to know how to apply for the funding. They need to know the right people. They need to go to the right parties, blah, blah, blah. You also need to then make a project that kind of like fulfills what like the money making, uh, giving side kind of like expects from you. So that means like all the middle layer is not free to do what they want. So which means I'm being really brutal here, but <laughs> means those people are not artists. Not, not from my perspective. It's just, it's just a different system. It is art, but it's kind of like closed. It's circular. It's sort of like, um, a, like a trade. It's, it's like a trade. Yes. And I have, I have no pro problem with that, but I'm just trying to explain that for me, it was not never possible to penetrate that, that layer. Right. So, so for me that I think like, so the top of the set, which is what I call the God artists, right? What I mean by that is like the people that create all the ideas and energies that trickle down into the middle layer and also to the hobbyist layer, but where I don't make it, uh, any distinction really in terms of content between the hobbyist and the, the God artist layer, because the hobbyists, they do as much great work as the God artists. It's just, I'm using different words here, but it's the middle layer that is, that is really difficult to penetrate. I mean, this is, this is a lot kind of like based on my kind of beliefs and I just haven't found ways to penetrate that. As I said, I have gotten very lucky in recent years that there are individuals, a wonderful lady from Switzerland who sends me a few thousand dollars every year because she loves what I do and she knows that I need some, some financial safety to keep doing what I do. And so it's people like Matthias and her that kind of help me move forward. There was recently for my, for my 50th birthday, there was a fundraiser that somebody, a friend set up that I wasn't aware of by Marcus, a Rhodes piano, electric piano. That's not the idea. And they gathered almost $10,000 for me to buy a piano. It's amazing, right? And so on that level, I'm, I'm really happy and feel very good and supported. So the, you know, like the, the patronage system, especially like public funding is like another question. Really, it's really, it's really hard for me to go there because I don't want to be, eventually I don't want to be told what to do. And you might be doing more paperwork than art. <laughs> yeah. It's, it's really kind of crazy. Even like say a half a day of paperwork and then like getting say 15,000, let's just say any number. It feels like the half the day is too much work for that. <laughs> I'm that, I'm that kind of guy. I'd, I'd rather keep creating a new piece of music. Than doing yeah. That. Yeah. <laughs> well, I want to be sensitive to the fact that our, our time together is, is winding down, but I, I wanted to ask you something about your use of touch instruments. And I'm very curious about what attracts a musician to that palette, because on the face of it, it feels very limited. And, and it also is so tied to 
at least in my image, to virtuosity. There's something almost bizarre about the touch instruments. And I don't mean that in a, in a negative way. I, and I apologize if it's coming across like that. They're just so, you used the word earlier, they're so anachronistic. And I wonder, what do you get from it? What, what, what are you able to do with a touch instrument that is unique to that form? I really I basically agree with what you, what you said. I can also tell you that if you have sort of this association with virtuosity, I can tell you that there's hardly anybody who plays those instruments like virtuo in a virtuosic way. I mean, there's a handful maybe in the whole world. Everything else is just idiomatic. Anybody can play an instrument in an idiomatic way. And like the Chapman stick, you pick it up, you put your hands on it, and it sounds like a Chapman stick. You start to sound smart. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it, it's that, yeah, not, not to me, not to me anymore, right? Because yeah. I know that it's just certain patterns that were like you do them and it sounds like that, you know, it sounds that way. It's not really hard. What I'm interested in and what kind of like drew me to it at the beginning was like this idea of decoding, like, you know, I have to say this, you're absolutely right. It's very limited. It's very limited, but in a way that I found that attractive because like I, then I see, okay, within this small dynamic range and this, you know, like the seemingly small number of articulations I can make with one finger on a string without plucking it, right? Like what, how far can I go? And I have over the years, I have learned to play super legato. I can sound as if I'm using a pick with my fingers because my fingers are so fast and stuff like that. So it's sort of like, it's almost like a sports challenge for me, like a physical sport, but also a mental sport. And that's why the touch instrument is, is still so attractive to me because it took me 30 years to come to this point now where there is like a system in place, which like for any kind of body who wants to start studying it, it will take them three years to learn what took me 30 years. And I find that fascinating. Like, as I said at the beginning, like I always had this kind of air of Marcus as a teacher around me and, and people were coming to me. And now, like, I really have something to give. And for me, this, this, it's, it's the psychologist side of me. Like, I wanted to find out how does it work? How can I best practice it with the, with the biggest, best results? And how can I pass it on? That's really why I still love the touch instrument so much. It is very expressive if you know how to play it. it because also, like, if, if you think about it, it's one of the most immediate instruments. Like on a guitar, you have to coordinate the picking and the fretting hand. Here, uh, or on a piano, you have the key between the string and your finger. Or, like, we don't even need to talk about synthesizers, which is like it's totally artificial. There's no real connection, right? So, but with uh, the f just one fingertip on a string, it really does translate anything that you could call intention and motion in the sense of like the way that I move the finger and the way that I think of putting energy into the string really changes the way that the note sounds. That is true for every instrument, like it is. But here with the, with the touch instrument, it's super immediate because it's only that one action and it's that one connection and any sort of like many movement you make translates into the movement of the string. And then because it's such a quiet instrument and played acoustically, you hardly hear it. So that means it gets amplified. That means that that little movement that the finger makes yeah. gets amplified like a thousand times or more with a compressor or a distortion or something like that. And then it becomes really alive and very, uh, to me, a very, very attractive, very attractive sound. Something that I do not, that I can't get with any synthetic instrument or any, uh, any keyboard instrument, for example. Marcus, thank you. Thank you for spending time with me. I could do this for another two or three hours. <laughs> Maybe we'll get to again one day. We can do this again. Yeah, sure. Thanks for inviting me. Thank you so much, Marcus Reuter. And as always, thank you for listening to Spotlight On, which is presented by Osiris Media and brought to you by Light. Executive producers are Lawrence Purrier, Ant Taylor, Brian Brinkman, RJB, and Matt Dwyer. Spotlight On is produced by Craig Snyder, with post-production by Michael Donaldson, and theme music by Q-Burn's Abstract Message. 
If you like what you've heard, please share us with a friend and leave a five-star review on your podcast platform of choice. Visit us online at spotlightonpodcast.com or via Twitter and Instagram at spotlightonpod. Thanks for listening. Be safe and stay in touch. Osiris.